Happy day everyone. Welcome to today's class. In today's class, we'll be learning about the fundamentals of history of economic thought. The first point would be that it gives us an extension to the ideas and thoughts that existed in the past and that molded the subject of economics. It, it gives you an idea about how those economists thought keeping in the social political paradigm at that point of time. This school of thought or the economic thought or the series of thoughts that existed uh, before 2008 or before the 20th century, we see that it had a huge relevance in the 2008 crisis. When the world was grappling with the financial crisis around that point of time, a lot of policymakers and economists had to go back to history and see what did our previous economists exactly do about uh, dealing with depression, the Great Depression, the recession, how did they deal with it, what kind of policies, what kind of programs they brought in, what kind of welfare schemes, what kind of fiscal monetary policies they brought in. It was time for us to go back and actually think about it. The fourth point would be that, like I mentioned in the first point, is that economic ideas have shaped because of the social political ideologies that existed at that point of time which is very important even today to understand how to frame economic policies. The final reason would be that for most of the economists or the thinking or the methodology that most of us require when we frame economic principles and policies is to have a well-balanced and reasonable judgment. And we see that throughout history, economics and the thought behind it did have the right balance and the reasonable judgment that is required for one policy maker to make an effective economic policy. This painting has a very strong significance, uh, not in terms of only for a painter or an artist, but also for an economist. On the left side that you see is Plato, the guru, and the right hand, that uh, the right side gentleman is Aristotle. This Painting signifies two schools of thought, which is the origin of the history of economic thought. We actually uh, give our entire credit to the Greek school or the school of Athens that we say uh, for building the fundamental building blocks of economics. This school of thought or these two uh, uh, philosophers were the ones who laid down the foundations of how a state, how people, how resources should be managed effectively. Moving on, there are some fundamental schools of thought uh, that uh, throughout history that we've discussed and that has played a big role in uh, a lot of uh, economies uh, and bailed out a lot of economies out of recession, uh, and all the uh, and all sort of ups and downs of the business cycle. Uh, these are just a few. There are more, but we'll be only focusing on the classical school of thought. But before we move on to the classical school of thought predominantly, it is very, very important to understand uh, who the predecessors are and who the successors are. The predecessors are the mercantilist school of thought, which uh, existed during the 17th and the 18th century. Uh, we give credit to economists such as North, uh, Locke, Petty. These are the economists. Thomas Munn, Sir Thomas Munn played a very, very important role in the mercantilist school of thought. They were a set of merchants and parliamentarians and set of administrators who created economic policy saying that we need to have a protectionist policy. And the only way for a wealth of nation uh, only way to increase the wealth of nation is to uh, effectively have trade, but not a two-way, but a single-way trade. They would want to impose tariffs and not import commodities from other countries. And that was the only way of accumulation of wealth that happened in the mercantilist school of thought. With the advent of this, we realized that this, this is not how we should function. So the logic and the kind of fundamental thought process did not, uh, it had its own repercussions, which we would not go in detail. But that led to uh, Adam Smith's uh, book, 
the wealth of nations which came up uh, or the book was written as an answer to why the mercantilist policies are not effective and why there should be a change. Followed by that, we have other schools of thought which was sort of um, a build up over uh, what uh, Adam Smith had uh, propounded, the neoclassical school of thought with the Cambridge economist, uh, uh, the most famous economist Alfred Marshall uh, was the one who came up with the neoclassical theories. Followed by that we had the historical school and institutionalism. Institutionalism, ideally, uh, one that we credit here is to the American economists who were all trained in Europe. Again, most of their economic policies were developed over the classical school and the neoclassical school of thought. And finally, John Maynard Keynes, his school of thought is what we refer to as the Keynesian school of thought, which of course um, focused post the uh, 1936, post his book, um, uh, which was a, a magnum opus book, which changed the entire uh, framework of economics and brought in the concept of how government intervention is so important uh, to bail out economies out of uh, various kind of ups and downs in an economy. Let's delve more into the classical school of thought. Now before we go on to the classical school of thought, it is very important to understand the approach used in the subject, be it any school of thought. Uh, of course being a history oriented subject, a chronological approach is very important. Uh, which is quite self-explanatory, but there's a timeline that is important to understand why a certain economic school of thought was introduced. This is more to do with uh, history and philosophy and logic. Followed by that, the classical approach, which we'll be speaking in detail, follows a deductive approach. Uh, a deductive approach is basically how, uh, how to test a particular economic system that already existed in that political social construct. Now, before we go on to the classical approach, uh, we need to understand that this is a Western school of thought. So the events that we speak about, the kind of social political paradigms that we speak about all existed in the European side. So most of the events, be it the uh, Spanish wars, be it um, the American independence, uh, all this uh, somehow affects uh, the kind of approach that we look in the classical school of thought. Finally is the inductive approach, which we do not follow in a classical school of thought. Inductive approach is more followed in the neoclassical and the succeeding schools of thought that came in picture. Of course, to understand any school of thought, uh, to understand the relevance of it, it is very important to get why this is so important even in today's context. We did uh, go through the significance of the school uh, of the uh, discipline. But it is very, very important to also understand that why this specifically the school of thought is important. Free markets, classical school of thought propounded for free markets. And that is why it is still relevant and we can still talk about it today. And they are the ones who actually brought in the concept of less government intervention and more to do with free markets. Let's delve more into the classical school of thought. The propounder that I would be speaking about today is Adam Smith, uh, born in the year 1723. Um, he was born uh, to a custom general officer, uh, a senior litigator in Scotland. Um, he was educated in the University of Glasgow. Uh, he was a professor in moral uh, and philosophy. More than economics at that point of time, it was moral science and political, uh, uh, political studies that, was, uh, that, that played a major role in what we call today as economics. His writings are the reason why the school of thought was founded and the fundamental of how the school was uh, officiated on. Uh, theory of Moral Sentiments, which he published in the year 1759, which lay down the framework of how an economist should think, uh, what are the principles and the logic that you need to really have to understand how to create an economic system. Followed by that, we had the most, uh, the, again, the magnum opus, and uh, one of the books that led to him being called the father of modern economics. An Inquiry into the Nature and the Cause of Wealth of Nation, published in the year 1776. We just uh, brush up through fundamental ideas what this book came out with. The Natural Order, the Natural Law, the Theory of Free Trade. This book was divided into five different parts and it addressed all these ideas that you see in the screen. 
The first one, the natural order, uh, was inspired by the physiocrat school of thought, uh, which existed in France at that point of time, which led to him actually coming up with the idea that you have to let it go. You have to leave the uh, private individuals to actually function in the market. You need to have a free market, free trade. Less government intervention is better. So you have to let the natural um, forces actually uh, play in the market. Social class. Book three and four has a uh, mention about the social class. Uh, this has got to do with his concept of division of labor. Uh, according to him, uh, labor is the one that adds value to the economy. With this concept, he brought in the concept of social class, which existed at that point of time. Mind you, when we spoke about mercantilist school of thought, there was already a very classist uh, a set of uh, ideology that exists at that point of time because the merchants, the bankers, and the professionals were the ones who were leading the entire game of economics at that point of time. So, uh, of course, there was a sort of elitist game that was going on. With his book, he actually pointed out the kind of class system that existed very predominantly using the various economic ideas that he had written for. Let's also try to understand what the concept of self-interest means to the classical school of thought. Self-interest, this is the main idea of classical school of thought. He believed that self-interest leads to a collective gain and that is how markets function. This laid the foundation of capitalism, what we call today. Uh, this is the quote from the book, Wealth of Nations. Uh, it's from part one of the book, which briefly describes the concept of self-interest and how that leads to a very effective economic policy at that point of time. This is the foundation of the classical school of thought. It is not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer or the baker that we expect at dinner, but from their regard to their own interest, we address ourselves not to their humanity, but to their self-love and never talk to them of our own necessities, but of their advantages. A butcher sells meat, not, uh, not having the mindset that he is contributing something to the society, but he is more focused on earning profits. And that is okay according to Adam Smith, because only if he has that kind of motive would he actually run a business. And that eventually serves the ultimate purpose where he's providing a resource to the economy. Now let's look what the concept of invisible hand means. The invisible hand concept played uh, is one of the most talked concept in the classical school of thought. We'll come to it, what he exactly says in the book. The person who employs his stock in maintaining labor endeavors, therefore, both to make among his workmen the most proper distribution of employment and furnish them with the best machines which he can either invent or afford to purchase. This is the direct quote from his book, uh, the part three of his book, Wealth of Nations. He explains that, that there is an invisible hand in play that brings in all the factors of production to make an economy, uh, uh, to make the economic activity effective. Uh, and he brings in the concept of laissez-faire also, which is less government intervention, which allows the producers to produce as much as they like, earn as much as income as they can, and save as much as they like. Adam Smith believed that it was safe to leave the economy to be propelled, which is the self-interest concept, regulated and controlled by invisible hand. The invisible hand here, what he talks about is the market forces. Less government interventions and more to do with the markets played by themselves, with the, uh, with the behavioral concept of self-interest. Let's also try to understand the distribution of income. One of the important theories of classical school of thought, which was developed based on self-interest, invisible hand, the concepts that we spoke from his book. What was his take on distribution of income? Like we discussed, there was an existence of social class at that point of time. And he did attribute that this was very important uh, also to define how labor is seen in the market, how a capital is seen in the market. He divided his, uh, the classes into capitalist, landlord, and workers. Now, the relationship between these classes gave the fundamental idea about social class. And the resources that they put in, for example, 
uh, a landlord is the one who owns the land, uh, the worker is the one who tills on the land, who works in the land and eventually the capitalist is the one who provides the resources. The interplay of these three individuals is the crux of income, how income is generated in the market. Now, Smith attributes or puts a particular keyword called capital accumulation. It's the interplay of all these three agents. He divides the labor, which is the workers in this context, as productive and unproductive labor. That is how he uh, imagines a particular economic activity to be categorized. Followed by that, he believes that the interplay of these three agents leads to the propensity to save. Let's look into what the theory of value is and what is Adam Smith's take on it. Today, when we speak about value, it can be in terms of what I think a particular product should be priced. For example, let's say a particular gold that I want to buy. Uh, in the market for one gram of gold, maybe it's 2000 in Indian rupees. But in my mind, I'm ready to give it probably 1000 rupees. But that, that's the kind of mindset you have or the kind of thought that goes in your mind as a lay person when you think about a value of a commodity. But what is the school of thought in, in the classical school of thought? What is the exact definition of value? Value of a good measure, measure is measured by the toil and the hard work of the labor. Like we discussed in the previous slide about the three classes that he mentioned. That was one was the worker, the capitalist and uh, the landlord. It is the effort of the worker that adds value to a commodity. That's, that's the essence of what Adam Smith had put forward. Value of a good by those who possess it and want to exchange is also measured by the quantity of labor. Like he had split the labor into productive and unproductive, it is the quantity of the productive labor that brings in value into the economy. And the price of good is nothing more than the sum of wages and profit paid to produce it. And hence, the propensity of save concept which he had brought forward when he spoke about distribution of income comes in picture completely at this point. You can uh, check out Ernesto's uh, Stefano and Scrapanti which is a concise book of all his ideas and also uh, Economics Evolving a History of Economic Thought which gives you a very very elaborate idea of the classical school of thought. I'd like to sum up the classical school of thought. We've only discussed very few ideas. There is more to it and they, they are more, they're more to the school, this school of thought. We've only discussed about the income and the value and the set of construct and thought process that is required to understand the classical school of thought. Uh, the other economist who uh, also contributed to the school of thought is David Ricardo, uh, Thomas Robert Malthus, uh, also uh, J.S. Mill uh, are also uh, the contributors to the school of thought. But Adam Smith laid the foundation of the classical school of thought. He was the one who brought in the concept of free market uh, laissez-faire economy, invisible hand, self-interest. These are the goals that one should keep in mind when you think about the, school, uh, the classical school of thought. Thank you.